well, let's say very briefly, uh, well, this is institute. This institute is a, a presidential, a small presidential foundation, uh, quite quite differently from the United States in Brazil. After you, f you finish your term, you go back home, and you have no pension, for, no pension personally, no money for uh, for zero for nothing, uh, and you have uh, people to take care of because you have uh, four assistants, uh, bodyguards, and cars, and do not do not do, do know where to put all these people. So we have to do something. In the past, the Brazilian president preferred not to do anything. Uh, it was a pity because of most of the archives have been destroyed because of, you know, it's difficult to keep, to take care of papers. So my decision was, let's try to see what can be done, uh, considering that I have only private sources, I have to ask for support from basic from uh, business or rich people. And we cannot ask for very high amounts of money. So how to, to conciliate the necessity to take care of the archives and to... Well, so I, I sent one of my assistants. She was before, when I was in office, she was working with me with the, the, the documents to, to, to visit briefly different institutes across the globe, some in America and some in Europe. In America, you, you know, it's quite different because the, the, the government... Uh, Normally supports normally the, the foundations and also because the, you have the uh, tax exemption for those who are giving money. That's not the Brazilian case. So we dis we decide to imitate what has been done by one of a friend of mine who has been present uh, from Portugal uh, two or three times, uh, Mario Suarez. And he, Mario Suarez has a small foundation in Lisbon, which is uh, in one house but highly with highly use of technology, uh, internet and so on and so forth. So I tried to, do, to, to imitate that in a very small place, kind of like the place in where you are. We have to, these two floors, the fifth floor in this, and two uh, basements where the documents are. And we used to, all, all, within our possibilities, the, the uh, more modern technology to take care of of the document, and also to give access. You can have access through internet of the majority of the documents. So, of course, some documents are still classified, you cannot have access, but the others you can have access. And since my, since my great-grandfather was already uh, under the empire in Brazil, in 19th century was governor of one of the Brazilian provinces. My grandfather was a field marshal, my father was a general and also member of the parliament. So we have involvement in political life in more than 100 years, 150 years. So I have documents for my family too. So all this is here uh, and we are trying to, to give access to this kind of the documentation. In the other day, one of the staff members came to see me with a letter. It was a letter by, uh, handwritten by my grandmother. And he was asking if it would be necessary to keep the letter. I said, look, this man, this man here, named Deodoro, his, 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 his family name is Fonseca, was the man who made the re republic in Brazil. The other one was this kind of, of thing, since 50, 100 years ago. So, by curiosity, you have this kind of thing here too. But you know, the, uh, I think it's senseless only to take care of archives. So we are also uh, creating here a kind of thinking tank modest thinking tank, but you have uh, uh, maybe two or two times every month around this uh, table in dis discussions with different people, uh, normally about the, Bra the Bra Brazilian agenda in the global era, era, which implies, of course, also sustainability, ec economy, business, and culture, so on and so forth. And since this is a non-party non uh, non organization, for instance, the Minister of uh, environment from Lula came to, and from Dilma too, came to have a discussion here, so on and so forth. We are very ample in you know, the, the way we are leading with these issues. We we'll try to invite people, normally we invite people from uh, the academia, from a business, from uh, newspapers, and from political uh, sectors. Uh, as an average, maybe 100 people came he around here every time to, to have the discussion. And all this is also uh, transmitted by internet. And you can have access to all, all discussion, all, all this public here. Then I uh, have a program to receive students to 
from uh, you know different uh, sec normally from secondary schools they are the, uh, the last uh, year in secondary school they came to have a free dialogue with me uh, the only thing they cannot ask me is about uh, party politics the rest is free and this is also transmitted by uh, the in uh, internet and as you have probably seen in, f in the fifth floor we have a, a small uh, exhibit with, uh, which is a kind of uh, synthesis of the more recent events in the Brazilian uh, life, and we have a program to also to uh, to give access to different uh, schools to to come here and to also to see because they don't have a more idea about what, what inflation means, you see, and so they have to explain to them what's that. It's difficult to understand how it was possible in Brazil to so survive when I was finance minister. Uh, the average uh, inflation rate every month was of about. 25 percent, which means annually, I don't know, thousands percent. So it was a crazy situation, and Brazil was under, under this kind of constraint uh, during at least two decades. I don't know how it was possible to survive, and how we are okay now. Uh, so this is what we are doing here. Of course, we have also a, a relationship with different organizations, and we have a, one program named Democratic Platform, which covers the, the Latin American process of democratization or non-democracy non in Latin America. So again, you have through internet uh, access to different groups in, in, in Latin America. And I personally, I belong to several organizations in, across the globe. I'll give you two examples only. One is a small organization created by Nelson Mandela, composed by 10 people. Uh, including himself, now he's uh, cannot uh, attend anymore because he's 93 or 94 years old. Uh, but uh, it's 10 people who have been influenced in political life or in, in cultural life, Kofi Annan, for instance, uh, or uh, Tutu Desmond, which is a, a Archbishop of uh, South Africa, was very influ very important in the apartheid, uh, uh, you know, struggles against apartheid, and. Uh, uh, Gro Brutland, who has been the head of the AG, 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 AG World Health Organization, and also she was the first one, the first person who put the name in a report on environment. Uh, so, and she is also a member of this group. And this group deals with you know critical situation across the globe. By critical situation, I give you an example: the so, so Sudanese uh, situation. North and South Sudan, or the relationship between uh, Gaza and uh, Hezbollah and Hamas and, and uh, uh, Israeli government, and also Birmania. Uh, the, the lady who is the leader of the opposition there was also a member of this group uh, when she was still uh, out of the political life. Now she uh, went back again to political life, so, so she's no more attending the meeting. But anyhow, this is a very specific kind of activity that I have with this uh, in this group. Uh, there are other groups. I, I belong to several. I don't want to 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 borrow you, but there is another one which is named the Drug Commission on Drug Policies, which is trying to 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 uh, focus in a different way the, the drug question. Uh, the, I'm chair of this group. We had we organized one group in Latin America, composed at the beginning by two or three former presidents, and now much more uh, presidents are involved, including the, the current president of, of Colombia and Mexico, etc., to try to see what can be done with the, 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 the drug question. And again, in the Global, pol uh, global uh, Committee, we have people from the United States, uh, the, the, the former head of the Federal Reserve, uh, my what? who has been assistant to President uh, Obama, I forget his name, is member of the commission, and, and people like that, to, to people with responsibility, well know, uh, to deal with this so difficult question, which is uh, how to try to, to change the approach and not be, not in, in, in to avoid to be considered as a defensor of, of drug use. It's not simple. So this uh, to, to give you uh, two examples of what a former president can uh, be involved in, you see. Uh, well, uh, and several other things here. 
So this is what we are doing here. Now, with respect to the situation you are asking for, I mean, how can, can we... First of all, we are discussing global leadership, which is a seemingly difficult question. I was uh, reading again a book I wrote 50 years ago on the, the leadership, entrepreneurial leadership in Brazil. The title is Industrialization, the Entrepreneur, something like that. I wrote 50 years ago in 1961. In, in well, I was discussing exactly the role of, of the business leadership at the time. And my point was, well, you know, I've made a review of the old bibliography about the, the business elite, uh, business leadership, uh, etc. And now it is different because now the, 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 we have to take in, uh, into account that the, because of globalization, I, 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 I didn't use globalization because the, the concept was completely out at the time. But because of the integration of the marks, I, I don't remember what I said. Uh, what is important now for a, a business leader is to take account of the global situation. You have to have to be, to to move from the inside the, the, the doors of the factory toward the world and to see the political situation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in the 70s, I was involved in in a program in Sweden uh, after the 72 meeting on environment uh, in Uppsala. We had a group there in Uppsala with some people from France and Norway and dealing, trying to, to develop some concepts which now are eco-development. I don't know how you, you label at the time, but we are trying to see the compatibility between growth and uh, nature, growth and, and, and environment. You remember that before that there was an organization in Rome, the Club of Rome, was uh, asking for a no growth uh, process in order to avoid a, a global disaster. For a developing country, this is not acceptable. So how to, how to conciliate development and environment? Well, we are still dealing with these matters in, nationally in Brazil and globally. And what is the sense of being a global leader now? I would say, uh, basically, uh, it requires the, the, uh, 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 integrated vision and to understand that what counts is people. And the idea that now is true that it's possible to deal with the concept of humanity without being only you know, a rhetoric. You have to take into account the interests of all, all the peoples of the, of the world. How to move from national interests toward a more uh, you know, uh, humanitarian vision. That is the key question for global leaders. And how to build institutions to deal with that. Unfortunately, we don't have yet. The institutions available in nowadays are the institutions built at the end of the Second World War. Uh, the United Nations and the, the, the trade organization, health organization, so on and so forth. Now, because of the G20, some progress has been made. But if you can read today in newspapers, you see that even regulatory agencies in Europe are trying to put order in the banking system. And it's difficult because bankers are resisting. So it's possible to, to face in the future again a uh, new financial crisis and it's really difficult to impose a, a, a global order into the financial system. So what is needed now is to have this ample vision and the capacity to create new institutions. This is not simple. It has, it has been done, after the, as I said, at the end of the Second World War because of people like Churchill, Roosevelt, Stalin, which are giants. Unfortunately, we don't, we, are, we don't have available giants uh, across the globe to try to see if it would be possible to re renew the, 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 the global uh, organizations, etc. But anyhow, the spirit is already there, and this is what is nece necessary to create this kind of, 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 of uh, uh, personality. And uh, we cannot be seen anymore only in terms of political life or economic life or envir environment. We have to put together and how to compatibilize all that. This would be, I would say, it would take 100 years to create global organizations capable to, co to compatibilize different uh, you know, interests across the globe. But that's the process in which we are involved in one way or in another way. You see, it's an old dream. You remember in, in the in 18th century, Immanuel Kant already said it was necessary to have a, a uniform uh, judicial, uh, legal system 
to, to end the capacity to impose rules globally. This is what's necessary. Still, it's necessary, but still we have national interests. How to conciliate, how to avoid a clash between national interests and the necessity to, to take into account humanity. So at the, the more ample level, this is what uh, is the question. I will fi finish this part, then we can answer your questions by saying that they belong to another institution, organization, small one, which is very interesting. It's a kind of shadow cabinet to follow the G20 uh, meetings. And this has been organized basically by, uh, he was born in Germany, he's a Jew, a mix between French and, and German origin, and lives in America, in, in California. Uh, named uh, uh, Nicolas Gebruin. Uh, and he has just now published, uh, well, he's, he's about to be published, I don't know if it has been already, a small book with another man named Gardos from California, from, from Berkeley, uh, trying to, 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 well, to have, a, to make an appraisal of the, the global situation nowadays, taking into account the Chinese interests and the American interests and the possibility or not to, to conciliate Chinese and American interests not avoiding the, the interests of other parts of the world. It's a very, 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 you know, uh, uh, at least uh, interesting book because it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of, of seed uh, uh, thinking about what can be done. And apparently in China, uh, uh, there are some leaders, or at least some intellectual leaders, who are being capable to understand that they have to, 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 to look uh, more uh, for uh, you know, uh, coincidence of interests than clash of interests, is it possible to have you know the, the convergences to see if you can produce consensus, which is extremely difficult. But anyhow, th these are the questions. You are the challenge, not for me anymore, but for you. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if you want to ask some questions, you said you said they have five different questions. <laughs> oh, we have a lot. We have a lot of questions. Um, First, I want to go back in time, and this question is, 50 years ago, what did you imagine your future would look like today? And is it, is it different from what you imagined? Are you happy? Your personal future, yeah, right? Yeah. 50 years ago, what were you thinking you would yeah. be doing, and where would you be? And then what was your, what was your thinking about what Brazil would look like? Yeah. And well, if you refer to 50 years ago, 50, yeah, not 30, yes. not 20, 50. Uh, 50 years ago, that is to say 63, I was about to leave Brazil to, to, to go to, into exile <laughs> because in 64 we had a, a, a military coup in Brazil. So I went to Chile, to Santiago, and then to France. Uh, and at the time, uh, our discussion was so quite so different from what uh, is our, our preoccupation now. Because what was the main question for Brazil and for, for Latin America at the time? The idea of development, you see? Still a question mark. Would it be possible or not uh, to develop? So under development was the key, the key issue, the key, the key question. Some people said, well, it's impossible to develop because we, we are at the periphery of the world system. The only way to develop is through a social revolution, socialism. Other people said, well, maybe it will be possible to approach uh, the center, I mean, the more developed countries, by, use, by in investing more, by extending uh, education, so on and so forth. In between, you had the Cuban Revolution, guerrilla uh, movements, and the Cold War. We were in the middle of the Cold War. So to be unthinkable what happened in, in 89, the end of uh, the, the, the Soviet Empire, uh, you know, would be impossible, unthinkable, completely unthinkable. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good question because in our horizon, nothing of what occurred. Uh, some years later on, in 66, 67, I wrote another book named Dependence and Development in Latin America. We made a, a seminar in, in Brown about the, it's to celebrate the 40th, 40th anniversary of this book. And in this book, I was uh, beginning to understand globalization without even naming uh, the process as such. Uh, uh, but then I was beginning to understand uh, the possibilities of a more integrated markets and the possibility of more uh, smooth forms of transformation from the underdevelopment into development. These were the, 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 
the key questions. Brazil at the time was already, you know, in, in the 60s, it was already a, you know, I would say, industrialized country, but comparing with the Latin American country, we had some industries in Brazil. Uh, we had good agriculture. Uh, the, our, I, I was at the, also working at the Economic Commission for Latin America, which is a United Nations organization to, who deals with the economy. And our, our dream was uh, to have uh, at least $1,000 per capita as GDP in, in, in Latin America, 1,000, you see. So now Brazil has, I don't know, 15,000, and it's still, but it was impossible because of, uh, the, we, uh, the Brazilian per capita income in the 60s, the 65, was uh, about between 600 and 500 dollars per capita per year. I remember first time I went to Europe. Uh, I, I, I was before uh, I was 61. I, I went to Spain. I, I passed through Spain, and Spain was at the time similar to Sao Paulo in terms of GDP per capita. Today, Spain has 25,000, 30,000 uh, per capita. Sao Paulo, 15,000. So they they made more progress than we did. But anyhow, we, we made an enormous amount of, uh, of progress in the last 50 years, you see. Uh, I said that we start in the 70s to discuss ecology and the environment in Sweden with some uh, friends from France. And uh, the Brazilian minister of, uh, finance minister was still alive. He came here very recently. Uh, he was also very reactionary at the time and was uh, the, the, the key person for the military in the financial era, named Delphine Neto. And he's a very, very, very intelligent man. But all, all, you know, along his life, he was very close to the more conservative point of view. And uh, Delphine said in 72, uh, how can I say this in English? Bendita. Uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, Cause <laughs> <gosblet> pollution. <laughs> Why? Because pollution means de development. Uh, hmm? So that was the. the, the, the yes. Pollution because pollution is development, yeah. because it, it, industry. So it's quite different. Uh, Uh, first, first off, on behalf of all of us, thank you for your time, Mr. President. Um, in the U.S. and increasingly around the world, uh, as our professor mentioned, uh, businesses are increasingly focused on the triple bottom line. Uh, what role here in Brazil um, is the government currently taking and can it uh, take in the future um, to, to promote uh, and ensure businesses have a positive impact, uh, not just on the people they touch and the environment, while well, at the same time ensuring profitability and alignment with shareholder interests? Well, uh, the current government in Brazil, as you probably know, uh, is now uh, is hesitating a little bit in terms of what to do with the Brazilian economy. And why? Because when I was in office, I, in, I introduced lots of, of reforms. And we, try, we decided to open up the, the economy this has been done before, but I, 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 I followed the, the same process to integrate Brazil more actively into the world market. And we, we, my decision was, let's open doors for the, the business sector to, to invest. Let's create regulatory agencies. And let's transform the role of the state, instead of being direct a producer, to be a regulator. Well, this has been highly criticized by those who are in government, mainly by the, the, the governing party, which is the working class party, whose leader is Mr. Lula. Then Lula became president. Lula is more pragmatic kind of people. He has no fixed principles. He changes following the, the winds, hopefully, because otherwise it will be a disaster, what he had in his mind before. You know? <laughs> <laughs> And so he decided to follow, more or less, the, uh, alongside the, the principles, the lines we were introducing. I must say that in Brazil, the, the state has, always has and will continue to have an important role to play. But anyhow, 
to, uh, to at least to ask also the business to, to come together. So Lula took the same. Now the present Dilma Rousseff, she is uh, more, uh, how would I say, cautious in that direction. But she's also more technocratic, comparing to Lula. I would say more competent. She knows about the situation. She, she, she is able to read uh, you know, data. So she's hesitating because she's, she's looking what's going on. She knows that's necessary to, to move, but because of his, uh, hers, uh, you know, uh, dogmatic approach, she always is all, all time doubt, doubting what has to be done. So and now she's maybe intervening too much, and the result is uh, not very positive. If you look what uh, is occurring now with the oil process, oil program in Brazil, or the energy program in Brazil or the infrastructure program in Brazil, uh, in all areas, you see, what is necessary is more uh, audacity, more capacity to, to take risks. And, and the government is trying to control everything. So uh, we are in not clear yet what will be the, the role of the Brazilian government in the future. Uh, said that, I'll say, the Brazilian society is strong. Brazilians, you know, Organizations are very solid. Not only not not only business. The the media is, is is independent in Brazil. The unions are independent. We have freedom in Brazil. We don't have yet the sense of uh, an egalitarian justice, but we have freedom to speech, to move, etc. And the Brazilian society has you know consistency. So, in spite of the fact that the government tries to move in, a, in, in one direc direction, I would say the, the, the movement coming from the, the earth, from the, the uh, grassroots, is more into, into the, uh, uh, the other direction. So, yeah, that's why I think, in spite of hesitation in government, the, the situation will move ahead. But the result up to in the last two years was, was doubtful because the G GDP was very low. Disease around one percent, which is insufficient for our, our necessities. What is more, you know, worrying than that is the rate of of of, of saving is very low. We are, we are Americans in that sense. In the government is, <laughs> is is motivating people to expand more families that, and and open more credit. You know the consequence of that. Uh, if you if you open the credit without uh, you know any restriction, the result can after, but we can. So that is the situation. There we go. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> so this morning we had the we're very fortunate through our friends from Santander to visit Iliopolis. Did I say that right? Yes. And some of the entrepreneurs there. And one of the projects we're working on is about the informal economy and the formal economy. And I'd like to get your opinion about what government can do to help bring people out of an informal economy into the formal economy and make it easier for them to move in that direction. I would say the Brazilian government is trying to do that. So it's a, it is a, a continuous effort, which has been relatively successful in the last years. Because we are, we are uh, the diminishing the you know the, the requirements to be to formalize, and also there are some programs to reduce tax. Because this may be the key question to reduce tax for small business. Otherwise, for them, it's impossible to formalize, and even for people. You see, uh, if you compare with what happened maybe. Every t 10 years, you'll see that we are trying to, 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 to make progress in, in the area. Still, it depends on uh, in what regions are you refer uh, referring to. One thing is Sao Paulo, another thing if you go to the Amazon or to the backward parts of the Northeast, or, you know, you, then you see that the levels of informality are very high. And now maybe because of more recent programs in terms of fellowship, I started this program to, to the cash transfer to give people, but Lula, you know, expanded enormously this uh, the program. So this is also interfering in the formalization because people p would prefer to receive a small, you know, uh, pension from government than to work and to formalize the the the, uh, the, the occupation. So there is a kind of uh, still a moving situation, but I would say. 
if you look the across time, we are making progress in decreasing, you know, the informal sector uh, of the Brazilian uh, economy. Um, you spoke about the rapid pace at which Brazil has been growing. What strategies do you see as being the most instrumental to employ to meet the growing demand? I don't know if I if I I, I kept you what. Um, with all the growth in Brazil, how do you think the demand can be met? Demand for, demand for food? Yes, no, 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 no. Yeah, well, uh, you see, the, the domestic demand in Brazil is expanding continuously, very, very fastly. Uh, because of political reasons, in, 20 years ago was you know, quite fashionable, to speak about the uh, the lack of food, hmm? programs to 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 finish uh, with you know uh, people without food, so on. but this was much more demagoguery than reality. Uh, the point is that still we have uh, undernutrition in several areas, uh, but not properly uh, the lack of food. You see. Uh, there is no this, such a phenomenon as you can see, uh, had in Africa or in Asia of people starving people because of lack of food. In some specific situations, for instance, in areas of, of, of dry climate in the Northeast, when you have a, a dryness season, then you had problems with food. But in the last maybe 30 years, we have programs to take care of that. You see? So we have. Uh, Malnutrition, yes, too. Now, on the opposite sense, too, obesity. Obesity is more the dramatic in Brazil than, than the, op the opposite, you see, which means that there is no lack of food. On the other hand, if you look at the price of food in Brazil, if you go to a restaurant in Sao Paulo, middle class or upper middle class, it's very expensive. But there are several levels of market. So you can eat very cheap, too. But the variation can be from 1 to 10 more, one to ten, and one is not impossible to, 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 to eat. I mean, myself or you, it's not impossible. Well, there is, uh, the, the name is per kilo. Uh, you pay per kilo, I don't know, uh, in Sao Paulo, 25 per, uh, reais, which is, means uh, 12 uh, dollars per kilo. And if you, if you, you probably have, I don't know how, <laughs> how your capacity in <laughs> <laughs> But anyhow, in my case, no more than 300, uh, one third of one kilo. So probably uh, with four dollars uh, or less, I can, uh, it depends, you see. So, of course, in some, in some specific areas, some situation, you have the problem. But in, as in normally, that's not the case. And why? Because we, are, we, are, uh, we have an old tradition in agriculture and, and food production, you see. Uh, still, what, what, we have an enormous amount of, of Products are uh, Western because we don't have good 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 uh, transportation because we are losing maybe 20 25 percent of our production every year. You see, so that's not our main question. In some areas, urban areas may be in some situations dramatic situations, or in the case of dryness or things like that, the government has to act. Uh, other other eyes, no, it's not not not, not dramatic the, the, the situation. Hello, Mr. President. I'm an international student from China. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just now you mentioned about uh, globalization. I read a uh, news that Brazil is a uh, negotiation with the WTO. So uh, WTO will require the uh, Brazil to reduce the import tax on the consumer uh, products. So what Brazil will do to help the internal industry? to help them to uh, go for the future. Yeah. If I understood, uh, the point is that to reduce tax to, 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 to ease the consumption, is that the question? Yeah. OK. Because, uh, WTO required the uh, government to reduce the import tax. The import tax, yeah. yeah. Import tax. yeah. Well, you know, import tax depends uh, of the situation. In some cases, in some moments, we need to, to, to have import tax. So, for instance, to protect in to uh, some degrees to, to, to protect the domestic you know production, but normally 
I think, uh, I, I think the, the, the trend goes into the direction of the reduction of import taxes, you see, not of the increasing of, of, of import tax. But this implies that you have to increase your productivity to compete more. You know? In some cases, you have to, to reduce taxes, uh, or for instance, in, in, in the case of uh, uh, mass consumption. In, in, in Brazil now, there is a trend toward the reduction of tax for food, some kind of food, at least basic, you know, uh, food to have to more uh, to amplify the access and not to reduce uh, tax in, in, in this area. And simultaneously now in Brazil, uh, the government is increasing tariffs for the import of other things, not food, other things. Uh, why? Because they want to protect the Brazilian industry. Uh, well, this is, uh, I understand, in some moments, but temporarily. Uh, otherwise, we will distort the, the, you know, the, the progress of our own uh, industry, you see. But as you know, uh, there is a permanent uh, kind of conflict between needs for uh, money, fiscal money, uh, capacity for uh, to people to pay, and also the limits of all that, that, you see. In, in our case, the, the, the tax burden is of about, I don't know exact, 36% of GDP, which is very high. It's very high. I mean, we pay tax in Brazil, you see. I mean, not we pay. So some people pay tax in Brazil. There are those who are don't prefer not to pay. But, any, but anyhow, the, the, the burden is very high in, 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 in general terms. If you compare with other Latin American countries, uh, for, for, for instance, in Mexico, it's 16%. Here, it's uh, more than double. Yeah? I think it's important for uh, mainly for developing countries uh, to have the capacity to use fiscal money because of education, because of health, because of, you know, to fight poverty. It, that, that, that's important. Without fiscal money, you cannot uh, take care of these questions. But we have limits to that. Maybe in our case, we are reaching the limit of the possibility to increase the tax. We have to decrease taxes in the case of, of Brazil. Meanwhile, in Mexico, they have to increase. They have to increase. In Mexico, the, the decision was to tax oil and to use the oil uh, income as if the oil income would be fiscal money. The result was a disaster for the, the oil uh, company because the oil company cannot afford the, Necessities of the country. See, so how to balance this? You know, in America, what's going on now in terms of of taxes? This is a permanent struggle. What to do? And you know, the, the rich people always are blaming that they are highly uh, taxed. The French now are making enormous protests because in French they are taxing 75 percent for those who receive more than one million euros per per, per year. Of course, it's a, a, almost an expropriation. You see. On the other hand, how to pay the debt? The America, America will face a, a similar problem in the future because your debt is so, you are not, the American debt is so enormous. I don't know how to, they will face this. I read yesterday two articles by Jeffrey Sachs, very interesting about, about what's going on in America. It's very worrying. So it's an extremely complicated problem. <laughs> in China, it's more simple. <laughs> So thank you again for being with us this afternoon. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about um, the current inequalities with regard to um, both race and gender, um, what progress has been made, and also what uh, can be done to improve these inequalities specifically with regard to um, education. Well, as you know, uh, the Brazilian society has been always considered as very unequal society, and this is true. This is true. The base for inequality came from old times, came from slavery, a concentration of land. Uh, you in America, you had also slavery, but you, the land concentration was no comparison, you know, has no comparison with Brazil. Because since the, the American uh, Union, the decision was to give access to land. This was very important you know, to, to decrease the, the, some uh, very important factor in terms of increasing inequality. In Brazil, land has been highly concentrated, and you had slavery up to the end of 19th century. So after the, the abolition of slavery, the, 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 the result was massive poverty and incapacity to integrate the blacks into the, 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 the market. 
uh, the blacks have been integrated relatively into the, 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 the capitalist market through lay, women as maid. You know, this was the way. That's why there is a kind of cult for the, the, the uh, black mother, because she was the, the key of the family. She was the, really the pillar of the family, the reintegration of the family. Uh, so the situation of the inequality was very profound in, in, in Brazil. And then we had migration, as like in America. Uh, if you go from Sao Paulo to the south of Brazil, today probably majority is no more composed by Portuguese people or people from Portuguese descent. It's by Italians, Germans, uh, Japanese, and, and blacks, and so on and so forth. So, and the migration also, at the beginning, uh, added a, a, a problem for, to, to the blacks, because they replaced the blacks into the, 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 the market. Uh, and some of them have, were also poor. Most of them were poor. So it was a long process to, you know, to try to, through social mobility, to expansion of the economy, to be more integrated into Brazilian society. So the injustice was, was very profound in Brazil. And not just with respect to uh, at the beginning, blacks and, and migrations, migrating people, but also women. See, uh, so there was uh, the, the tradition, the Iberian tradition, was much more a male tradition. Uh, well, in our case, it's not that dramatic as in other uh, Hispanic situations. Uh, maybe because of this is a, a kind of uh, paradox because of slavery, because the women from the the, the white families. Uh, have been trained in giving order to the slaves. There is a, 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 a foreign visitor to Brazil in the 19th century, a French man named Saint Hilaire, who wrote that uh, the Brazilian women, uh, they used to speak very loudly. And why? Because they ordered to all time slaves. See? But the point is, the, 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 in, in, the, in the traditional uh, family, the role of the, 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 the woman uh, was ambiguous. At inside wall, the walls of the home, but in, but they had enormous uh, uh, power in, inside the well, And then you know, when you look what happened with the work, the 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 the, uh, the, the expansion of the the, the the market, or the working market, we will see that the, the the proportion of women is very high. Has been always high. Now it's I don't know exactly, but it's around forty five percent, if not more are composed by, as you know, in America, the big transformation uh, with respect to the relationship between men and women was during the Second World War, because the, the, the men have been recruited and the, the women became uh, workers, and this has been very important in transforming the, the culture in America. In our case, the labor market was very important for that. And we have been forced to recognize the role of women uh, when we decided, for instance, I decided to 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 create this program of class, uh, cash transfer, the decision was to give money for the lady, not the man, in the family, uh, because uh, the women were much more uh, stable and and capable to take care of children than men. So, but they, they were, then, uh, well, there are different aspects who are re redefining the role of women. Still, of course, there is no equality. But they are, they are forced moving in the sense of more equality. With respect to the blacks, the situation was, was very, very dramatic in Brazil. We had always the kind of mythology about a, a ra racial democracy. My first works were in this field I, when I was still very young. I wrote some books on the blacks in Brazil. Uh, to, well, to our surprise, uh, the discrimination was very high. I'm referring to the, the, the 50s, in, during the 50s. It was very high. In, in clubs, or everywhere, you have discrimination between uh, blacks and, uh, uh, and whites. Well, this still we have, but this is moving uh, more positively more recently. Uh, now we have some programs of uh, you know, uh, affirmative uh, policies, uh, so we have, uh, is, I know this is controversial, but we have quota for blacks in universities. Uh, there are also in, in public service, there are incentives to, 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 to employ blacks. So this is moving. 
if you watch the TV in Brazil, you will see that always now blacks are appearing there. In, uh, 20 years ago, it was not like that. Or 15 years, uh, 50 years ago, at zero. Because the, the idea was, well, let's put blacks aside. Brazil, let's, there was an ideology of whiteization, blanquização. To, to import more uh, uh, white migrants from Europe to, to, to turn the Brazilians more, uh, you know, uh, white. No more. Now there is a kind of, of pride of the, uh, of the mixed situation, you see. They are almost, uh, again, a cult of, of, of the mulatas, mulatos, blacks, and so on. But still, if you go, if you go down into the, the, the social scale, the discrimination is not very high. As far as you go high, up, well, still, not, not simple. I don't give you the name of the person, but I, uh, just very recently in, in Rio, uh, I was involved in a discussion about the acceptance of one of big, big Brazilian uh, football players in an elite club in Rio. The resistance was enormous, and it was not, you know, not yet solved. He's a worldwide famous man. No problem, he's not white. So I cannot disguise the situation. We still have, but we are, we are moving. And if you look at the educational situation or the, the poverty situation, income distribution, you'll see that always the blacks are in the worst position. If you want to promote blacks, maybe it will be enough to promote poors, because the majority of the poors are black. So still we have problems in that sense. Not legally. Our legislation is very open. It is a crime to discriminate. It is a crime, so on and so forth. There is a permanent struggle against that. But still it will take some time. To I would say, say that, that on the other hand, uh, even the, the fact that we proclaim that we had a kind of racial democracy implies the desire of have a, 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 a racial democracy. You see, it was not true, but you, even officially, you are insisting we are a racial democracy is positive, because we are motivating people in the sense that it's better to have a, 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 a racial uh, democracy than not to have a harsh democracy. On the other hand, culturally, uh, we don't have what in other parts of the world is, exists, a black culture and a white culture. There is no such, such a difference. The culture is the same one. You know, one of the, the samba, for instance, is a national uh, uh, you know, music. It's not a black music. It, some of the most famous, uh, not samba, but then how Brazilian composers are white, and they compose as if, as if not. They don't have the notion that they are white or black. Culturally, we are much more integrated than, than other, other, other uh, cultures. And uh, we try to assimilate immediately. Uh, we, we don't have a white cuisine. We don't, like, like in America, you go to the, the uh, Caillou, I don't know how to say that, in the south of the United States. Uh, we don't have a, our cuisine is mixed. Uh, the food I mean, is mixed. You know? uh, Maybe the, 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 the success by football players has been important in disseminating the idea that the blacks are good. You know? And also the, the music and, so on, and the carnival. So this is contradictory. What I said before, that you have the, 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 the pre prejudice and what I'm saying now. But, but life is contradictory. We have yeah. Time for just only a couple more questions. Thank you, Mr. President. The question is, uh, what do you see as the greatest hopes and the greatest fears for Brazil in the, next, in the future? Well, I think what I just said to you about our uh, flexibility in, in cultural terms, I think this is, this is a, a positive, you know, is an asset for, for Brazil. Because supposing we are marching toward a more integrated global order and a more democratic global order, we have to accept the others, the differences. And in some sense, we have differences in Brazil, we have, we had, uh, and we still have pre prejudice, but we accept more easily the existence of, of the opposite, of, of others. We, we are more uh, uh, 
prone to, to, to admit differences. I think this, this is a, a cultural advantage. On the other hand, I would say, in spite of enormous uh, difficulties we had in, we faced in the, in the past, if you look in, in, in the 20th century, uh, up to 1980, only Japan had a rate of growth per capita higher than Brazil. Uh, now we have in agriculture, we, if, you, if you list the 10 top export products, Brazil is uh, well, among maybe seven or eight in every. The, the first or the second, first or second in seven or eight items, you see. So we have good agriculture. Brazil is maybe the only really more industrialized country in the Americas, in, apart from the United States and Canada. Huh? We have industry, real industry, not, not just you know, uh, assembly. Of, of different parts you have in, in, in Brazil. If you have this, you look services, you look internet, or the, the banking system. The banking system, because of, of inflation, was forced to move very quickly using the internet and this kind of instruments to, to be very quick in, in reconsidering the assets so on, and, and so forth. So the services are making progress. So we have, uh, we have well, if you look the the list of these 10 biggest GDP economies, Brazil is, uh, is there. What is still lacking? More justice, more equality in terms of human relationships, more education, you see? This is what we are. We, we are now in a point in which what is important is no more the quantity, but the quality. And how to give this, uh, you know, the, 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 to go ahead, transforming quantity into quality is not simple, you see? Brazilians love to compare ourselves with uh, because of our GDP. Wow, but if you go to, to Denmark, very small GDP, but what kind of life, of, of quality of life. So what we don't have yet is uh, this, you know, uh, this kind of intangible uh, values which still have to develop. Hi. Last question. Um, one of the questions our group is focusing on is, um, what are some of the most promising tools that you see in Brazil for increasing social mobility? Well, Brazilian social mobility process is, is, uh, is a long process. I received re uh, recently from an old, uh, old student of mine, who is now 70 years old, <laughs> and he gave me two or three weeks ago a book he wrote, and I made the, the preface, I, I did no idea anymore, about social mobility. And this book has been published at the beginning of the 90s and was referring to the second half of the 20th century and the, the rates of social mobility were very high. Now this is still more like that. There is a kind of exaggeration even in nowadays by saying, well, now we, have, we are adding to this middle class, I don't know how many millions of people. Well, it's not exactly that. We are expanding the, 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 the strata in terms of, uh, of income, which is not necessarily implies in, in transforming people into middle class. Class sociology is more complica complex than that. It's not just income. It's a similar education, a network of relationship, similar values. That's not yet the true, but in help social mobility, yes, it's, it's based on the expansion of this uh, of income, and you are expanding the the, the, the income of, of several strata. So there are lots of data to show you that this is a, a process, not just old one in continuous, but it's now dramatically increasing in the last 20 years and is increasing more and more and more. So this is the, the dynamic, the social dynamic is very, uh, very high. Uh, I, 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 I repeat, comparing with uh, what is a middle class consumption in America or in Europe, it's still always very modest, very modest. The patterns of consumption are still uh, very modest. But anyhow, and this is what I uh, share as in terms of future. We, ha we have hope. And the hope is not just a, s a sentiment. It depends on, also on experiences. You see? And this, uh, I remember when I was making research a long time ago, the first research on, or, or on employment, uh, I participated in this research some years ago, some decades ago. And um, it was very impressive because the sense of the, the, the father in their family was, well, my situation is not that, that good, but my son will be better than myself. My daughter, too. So this is the, the feel good. They are feeling good. Hmm? If you look at uh, surveys about the situation in Brazil, and if you compare with reality, 
will be surprised, right? It's not that good. But the sense that you are making progress, because we are making progress. It's a personal experience of, of you know, of, of being more included, of having more access. So that's why, you know, this is a, the American had the experience 50 years ago. Now you are in the, maybe in the ceiling. You are trying to see, well, to avoid disaster. <laughs> Uh, Mr. President, uh, not a last question, but uh, I was uh, willing to ask you uh, not an, an advice, because you have a phrase in Brazil, if your advice is good, we don't give, you sell it. <laughs> but if you <laughs> can give us, let's say, a kind of a tip, I'm uh, struggling with what you say just in the beginning, that we, in the 50s or during the World War, we have only three giants, yeah. right, Churchill, Roosevelt yeah. and Hitler. So maybe we can prepare a giant for the future from this class, from this room. I hope. <laughs> I hope too. <laughs> if yeah. you can give us, let's say, one last tip uh, to really help these guys and these kids to think about differently in the future or to build, let's say, uh, make a difference and can keep a, a different uh, legacy for us all around. I would say be flexible in your behavior and be very consistent on in your, with respect to your principles. You have to be convicted that you are right. And if you are, you have to follow what you think is right. And you have to preach in the sense that you are convinced that you are, you know, is a good good cause to to to, to fight for. You see? And be flexible in the way you try to lead with others. You cannot just impose. You have to convince. I think the modern leadership, the, the, the democratic leadership, requires this. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>